welcome back to the Gateway. This is for our online viewers, those who are at home tonight. So, for those of you who are at home, I pray God's meeting with you like he just uh, was meeting with us and is continuing to meet with us here. So, with that in mind, we're going to get back into Bible study. And last week we looked at, uh, we were, we're in 1 Peter now, and last week we actually looked at uh, 1 Peter. Uh, I think we're in, chap we were in chapter 2, verses, I think, 11 through 25. That's what we looked at last week. So 1 Peter, uh, chapter 2, 11 through 25, that was finished out in that uh, chapter of 1 Peter. And actually, just a, just a light look review, just a quick glimpse. You know, last week we actually saw Peter uh, speaking to believers and saying that uh, that they were residents, they were resident aliens and foreigners. And we looked at that in detail last week, but it's really neat because that that really helps your perspective, doesn't it? You know, this is not this is our temporary home. We're passing through. But it's neat because the resident alien foreigner thing, it means actually someone who's there, it's not their home. They actually don't have full citizenship. Yes, we're American citizens, but you don't really have full citizenship to do what every other American is doing, you know, or, or what's normal for the culture, because we're foreigners, but we're to be close, and we're to be closely connected with the with the natives, closely connected with the non-believers. It's kind of interesting the, what the means of those words, the way Peter, well, the Holy Spirit actually through Peter put them in there. But yes, we're passing through, but we're to have meaningful relationships with non-believers as we pass through. <laughs> and praise God. Mm. And so... Um, and Peter talked about the way to do that is have an honorable life. Have an honorable, God-honoring life in the communities and in the places where we are. That way the people around us that are non-believers, they see something different. And then we can refer to other scripture and that hope, you know, if we're living an honorable, God, a God-focused life, they'll ask us about the hope because we'll be happy whenever everybody else is not. <laughs> we'll have a smile when other people do not. We'll stay consistent and constant because of Jesus. And so that's, uh, that's the way we represent him as we're passing through this world and through this life. Um, but then Peter went on to tell us to submit to our government, which we're doing, as long as they do not require anything of us that will compromise our faith or that will cause us to go against other scriptures. Okay? So we're to submit to the government across the board unless they're making us you know, renounce our faith, do something against God, or do something against the other scriptures that God has that requires to do things. And I love Jesus. Jesus said, give, give to Caesar what's his and give to God what, what's his. And that, that's really a neat thing. Not always easy to do, but it's, it's a very neat picture and perspective. All right? And so then Peter went on to talk about our bosses at our jobs. Same thing with them. We're to love them. We're to be honorable. We're to do things right. Um, you know, but once again, we're to do everything we can as long as they aren't requiring us to, to, to go against our faith, against God, or against other scriptures that tell us things that we're supposed to do. All right? And so uh, last week, I thought it was really neat, because Peter did a great job. He started out with the government, went to the bosses, the workplace, and then he finished it up with a picture of Jesus, our perfect role model. I thought that was so good, because Jesus did all of that that Peter was just telling us to do, and Jesus did it right. And so he really uh, closed out well talking about Jesus and how Jesus was able to do all those things that Peter was just telling us we had to do. So this week, we're going to pick up in 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse 1 through 7. And I went with the Amplified Version this week. Normally we use the Passion Translation, but I really like the Amplified better uh, for this portion of Scripture. Because the Amplified has a lot more notes in it. I remember... Um, one pastor saying one time said, I'm used to amplifying the amplified version they so you can touch your hearing aids off. And I thought that was kind of cute. You know, <laughs> it's just louder than the other translation. Um, but it also gives you a lot more details, which is kind of interesting. Um, so let's pick up. We're going to read verse, uh, actually verse 1. And you can see the amplified adds a lot more content. But I will be reading every little note within the brackets, too, because it helps understand what's going on. And so in these verses, Peter's going to be talking about the marriage relationship. And he says, In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, subordinate, not as inferior, I love that note, but out of respect for the responsibilities entrusted to husbands and their accountability to God, and so partnering with them. 
That's a good note and an accurate note for that. All right? And so it says, so that even if some do not obey the word of God, they may be won over to Christ without discussion by the godly lives of their wives. All right, so I want to kind of dig into that just a little bit, okay? I believe here that Peter is speaking to couples that when they were married, they were both non-believers. And while it was, this is an old, an old context here, this was most likely written to people right after Christ had come, lived, and died. So he's writing to that group. And so a lot of them had never heard of Christ. So when they heard about Christ, possibly the, the wife believed, the husband did not. But both of them had heard about God because that's what he's talking about, you know, because the man, uh, you know, he didn't respond, but the woman did. But I believe that applies to us today. You know, if you're a married couple and one of you meets Christ, we're going to focus on the ladies here, but one of you meets Christ and the other one uh, does not want to become a Christian, that puts you in an interesting spot. I mean, it does. I thank God me and Cheryl, have, I, was a, I was a non-believer when we got married for a period of, what, two years? About two years. Yeah, I was a non-believer and she was a believer. And I'm sure that I, I was not good at all for her, uh, her relationship with Jesus for those first two years. But then I came, I, become, I became a Christian. Um, but I want to talk about when it says wives, be submissive to your own husbands. Uh, you're not in fear. The, the wife is not in any way inferior to the husband. All right? People teach that, uh, that the wife is inferior. No. Different roles and responsibilities. Unique equals. Unique, different equals. All right? and we're going to talk more about that in a few verses. All right. But I really like this because apparently in this scenario, the wife has trusted Christ, the husband has not. And so um, I like it because the way he talks about it, it, we'll pick up right here, it says, so that even if some do not obey the word of God, in other words, they've heard the word of God, they've heard how to be saved, they've heard of Christ, they may be won over to Christ without discussion by the godly lives of their wives. I think it's interesting Peter went that route because you know, we, we talk and we act, but most of our communication is nonverbal. Uh, things like that. Seventy percent or more is actually nonverbal of our our communication. But I really think that men men do not like being told what they need to do. Nobody does. Nobody does, but particularly guys. I'm telling you. Okay, I can speak for guys. Guys <laughs> don't like being told what to do. <laughs> Cheryl's laughing over. Yeah, they don't. Um, but if a guy sees you do something, they'll pay closer attention. Don't we, guys? We'll watch. We'll watch, and if we see somebody doing something or having a lifestyle or something's working for them, we'll say, huh, we'll pay a little, a little more attention to that than somebody telling us what we need to do over and over again. And so I think that's what Peter's really zeroing in on there, is men are doers, and they, they're, you know, they're action people, and they like seeing things in people's lives worked out or expressed through action. I think that's what he's saying is, ladies, don't pester your husband to death about Jesus. Love him. Be nice. Be kind. Model it. Show him grace when he don't deserve it. Be nice. Give him that pat on the back when he don't deserve it. You know, keep loving him even when he does deserve it. Just keep that consistent, God-honoring lifestyle. And little by little, that will speak louder than anything that a wife could ever say. Let's keep going. Says it too, it says, when they see your modest and respectful behavior, together with your devotion and appreciation, love your husband, encourage him, and enjoy him as a blessing from God. Let's see, we're, we're seeing consistency here. It says, when they see your modest and respectful behavior, let's stop. You know, when somebody has a true encounter with Jesus, when they meet Jesus, they trust Jesus with their whole heart, they turn their life over to him, guess what? It brings stability into your life, mm -hmm. man or woman. It brings stability. It brings consistency. It brings a constant hope and a constant life that non-believers just don't have. It don't matter what they may tell you. They don't have that. Because, see, they're building on the, they're building on the sand. It don't matter what they got. They're still building a house on the sand. The, a believer that's one day old in Christ is still standing on a rock. Amen. And the next day they're standing on a rock. And the next Amen. day they're standing on a rock. And so that's what I really believe is talking about. It says when they see... You're modest, respectful, consistent, day after day, lasting, persistent, wholehearted, loving, life-giving behavior. You can't argue with that, can you? You can't argue when you see someone, man, man, they just got something that's different, and they're always doing better than, than I am right now, you know? And that's, uh, 
I really believe that, that will speak to a husband. Okay? Your adornment must not be merely external, with interweaving and elaborate knotting of the hair and wearing gold jewelry, or being superficially preoccupied with dressing in expensive clothes. But let it be the inner beauty of the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable quality and unfading charm of a gentle and peaceful spirit, one that is calm and self-controlled, not over-anxious, but serene and spiritually mature, which is very precious in the sight of God. Okay? So I want to kind of touch on this. First of all, God doesn't have any problem with stuff. I want to point that out. God has no problem with jewelry, no problem with nice clothes, no problem with stuff. He does not. I mean, I know a lot of people preach, you don't need this and that and other. Well, you know, you don't know if they need it or not. And, and, and things, if God's blessed them abundantly, they may have a ton of stuff, but they may be giving a ton of it away too, and you just don't know about it. Mm-hmm. You know, they just may, may be that jag gutter pipe or that funnel that God's pouring so much through that they just got a lot of leftovers. They got a lot of residue. But God don't have a problem with stuff. I want to start right there. So ladies, God don't have a problem with nice hairstyles. He don't have a problem with nice clothes. He don't have a problem with nice jewelry. He does not. Okay. And so, with that in mind, I want to roll it back up here to the first part. Your adornment. In other words, the things people see should not only be external. That's really what Peter's focused on. He's bringing a con. This is a big contrast here between what is what. Where is your focus at? What is more important to you? The internal. The sweet spirit, that where it got down at the bottom, it says the calm and self-control, not over anxious, the serene, the spiritually mature, working on your, your life with Christ, those internal things. Those should always be more important than anything external. Mm-hmm. And boy, that is like, man, I'm making a statement that people would probably say blasphemy in this culture for the most part. I mean, I, you know, I don't even know the right word for that, but <laughs> <laughs> this is non-American. <laughs> No, I think standard ladies, buy something else. Hey, don't worry. Just just look good, feel good, man, just whatever you want, go for it. Get, you can get around to Jesus later. No, that's not. But but you see what I'm saying. Most people, they're more concerned about the impression they make with what they have. What they see is more important than who you are a lot of times. And so I just want to say that ladies, I'm telling you, a godly lady, a godly wife is absolutely incredibly beautiful to the world and to her husband. It's just incredible. But see, whenever whenever you do wear the, the do the hair and other things, those things are meant to complement the woman of God you are. They, they should never be overpowering. They should never take away from the beauty that you are. So kind of wanted to hit that. Once again, God don't mind your stuff. He just don't want your stuff to be more important than he is. Or your stuff to be more important than he, you, who you are in him. Mm-hmm. That's good. For in this way, in former times, the holy women, and it's actually kind of zeroing in on the, the wives of the patriarchs, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which became Israel. It's kind of focusing on that older era of ladies, but... Because it's, it's, Peter's kind of wanting to dial back into something here. It says, for in this way, in former times, the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves. They adorned themselves with this, a calm, self-controlled, not over the serene, spiritually mature, consistent, constant, day-to-day God-honoring lifestyle. That's how they adorned themselves. It says, they hoped in God, they used to adorn themselves with that. It says, being submissive to their own husbands and adapting themselves to them. Now, once again, we're going to zero in on that partnership, okay? And we're going to look at that some more in the next verse, but I want to kind of touch it. We're talking about unique equals, <laughs> okay? Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, following him and having regard to him as head of their house, calling him Lord. And you have become her daughters if you do what is right without being frightened, by any fear, that is, being respectful towards your husband, but not giving in to intimidation, nor allowing yourself to be led into sin, nor be harmed. I really like the notes in this, man. This Amplified, they do a great job with this. Because a lot of this, what, this, these are some scriptures that I'm talking about tonight that there is, people are all over the place with this. I mean, they are. 
But once again, you have to look at Scripture in the context of the whole of the Bible. And so there are, there are lots of Scriptures that speak about ladies, their roles, responsibilities, and wives, and there are Scriptures that talk about husbands. So I'm kind of I'm taking what Peter's got right here. We're looking at this specifically, but also we're, we're getting the bigger scope. All right? So Sarah, she obeyed Abraham. Now, why did she obey him? Sarah could have led too. You hear me? And she was leading. You just didn't see a lot of it in the Bible because it wasn't written about. The wives, the wives didn't get a lot of chapters, did they? <laughs> <laughs> no. It was a male-dominated society. So the men got the chapters, and the wives were behind the scenes doing a ton of work. They were doing a ton of the stuff. But, see, but whatever it says, I like the note here because this brings some clarity. It says, she followed him and had a regard for him as the head of their house, calling him Lord. See, men are pioneers. We're meant to be pioneers. We're meant to be the primary spirit in a, in a husband wife relationship. We're kind of the spearhead, the pioneer, the people who who are the, the, the kind of the fighters, the takers of ground, and the women are the inhabitants, man. They're the ones who are going to nurture, love, inhabit, make the most out of everything, be a blessing. And that's the way we're created to be. That's why men are generally a little more durable because we're going to get the crap beat out of us, providing a spot for the wife to do it, be all she can be. And we're, we're going to talk a little more about that. I've actually taught a lot of guys about this stuff over the years. Okay. It says, in the same way, you husbands live with your wives in an understanding way, with great gentleness and tact, and with an intelligent regard for the marriage relationship. As with someone physically weaker, since she is a woman, show her honor and respect as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered or ineffective. So let's talk a little bit about this first, and I kind of want to run into something else here before we close out. All right? So in the same way, husbands, it says, live with your wives in an understanding way. If husbands would just get this right here, live with your wives in an understanding way. You may think, well, there's not a lot to that. Oh, yes, there is. Understanding <laughs> that God created me to fight for her. God created me to do everything I can to see that every gift, everything in her is fully expressed. And I wish there was a whole lot more guys here, but guys... We need to understand our wives and understand that God made us strong so that we can give our strength away. He didn't make us with strength so we could use it all on ourselves. Okay? Uh, we're not to pursue our dreams, our call, and our plans and leave our wife in the shadows back there. We're supposed to use our strength for other people. We're supposed to take our strength and pray for them and fight for them and help them and bless them and cover for them whenever they're, they're, they're stressed out. And, and just, man, I can just roll on and on with this, but... That's our place as guys, is this strength and this durability, this is the half, the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The three of them gave us that masculine, tough, strong, pressing, pioneering side to fight for other people. While he gave the woman, the other half, the three gave the woman the half, the love, the nurturing, the, the, the sensitive spirit, the care. The, the, the ability to just inhabit and make anything beautiful, to, to be able to love people, to just be able to be connected and have those relationships that us guys struggle with sometimes. But that's just a few of the qualities that the three who are God divided between the man and the woman. So there is no inferiority, all right? The three who are God gave her everything she was supposed to get, and the three who are God gave us everything we're supposed to get. And we're supposed to co-reign and rule. We're supposed to both be in dominion, as it was said in Genesis. We're supposed to rule and reign and then have children who are supposed to pick up where we leave off and keep ruling and reigning, both male and female. So it's not a one or the over the other thing. It's an understanding thing. All right? So guys who are here, pour your life out seeing your woman succeed. <laughs> I'm telling you. That and your kids. So I'll hush. I know I've been on this for a little bit. but That's good, honey. I'm telling you, a good marriage does not happen. It doesn't just happen. You have to work your butt off, and you're going to have to, both of you are going to have to give everything you got, and then, guess what? Get up and do it again tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but also, guys, please protect your woman. Protect your wife. I'm telling you, you're soon to be wife. You protect. I know, I know you're strong. You can do all this, but the fact is there are things that, that he is supposed to do to keep things from getting to you and to provide spots for you. So anyway, I'll move on. I talk a lot about this, but I actually enjoy marriage a lot. I've married a long time, and I love it. 
I love it. And I love doing, I love pouring my life out for her. Because mm -hmm. guess what? When your wife succeeds, the two are blessed. The two are one, but when any one of you succeeds, both are blessed. Okay, let's do one. All right, let's see if there's anything else. I think I covered that pretty well. Is any any question or anything? We still got a couple minutes. Any questions before we wrap up? It's hard to communicate some of the husband and wife things because I, my heart. I'm very passionate about marriage and about equality and about all that, and so is God. But so. Any thoughts, questions before we wrap up? I think that the when it talks about at the end of the chapter where it says, so that your prayers will not be hindered or ineffective, I think that really speaks to, that. I think that's one of the big signs in a relationship that, that unity is not, that the unity is not where it needs to be. Mm. And when, when there's some hindrances in prayer, you know, pr prayer is going to reveal a problem. Yes. If the, and we don't even necessarily see it, but in your prayer time, it'll be evident what what's there, and and yeah, it helps. It helps. It helps you know where to focus in. That's really good, Cheryl. Yes. Amen. I, I agree on that. That I think is so good because I don't know about you folks, but when I come into prayer before the Lord, things pour out that I. I may not be able to say face mm -hmm. to face and so yeah. I was you know, praying with somebody about a problem, it's easy to to release it to the Lord. Mm -hmm. He's here and some he can just he gets in there and mm. yeah. that's what I can't do mm. just in my own personality. Mm. That's good. That makes yeah, it does. That's good, Sheila. So, you know, when you come and I you know, I wish that uh, you know, with my ex husband that I we would have prayed together. We might be able to work through some things, or it would generate a, a discussion that we couldn't do in our own flesh. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's good, Sheila. And that's what me and Cheryl used to caution people who were dating. Mm -hmm. If they were dating and it, and they weren't, you know, a, didn't have a you know a, a marriage schedule on the calendar, and, and they weren't almost there, we'd encourage them to be careful praying together alone, because if, you know, <laughs> because you know. The, the, you know, the hearts get, get mashed and it gets, it'll get more serious quickly. So we're like, we tell women now, you probably don't want to be just praying, you know, please, you know. <laughs> yeah. But for husbands and wives, that's one of the first things I encourage people to do is intimate. to pray together. Mm -hmm. Husband and wives pray together and lay hands on each other and pray for each other. Mm -hmm. Do that. Uh, do Try to do that daily, mm -hmm. you know. To lay hands and pray specifically for each other's needs, but then just to spend time praying together. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's it's amazing. It really is amazing. Yeah. Praise God. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up, but, um, you know, as we do, um, just know that families are, families are having, they're under attack in our, our country today. They are. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but they really are. There's so many things they're trying to just literally whittle away and chip away at the, the, the sanctity and the beauty that is the husband and wife, you know, the man and woman, family. Uh, and it's just, it, it, the way the family goes, so goes the world, you know. And if the families are destroyed, think about what's going to happen to everything else. Because that's where, that's the, the family is the birthplace and the incubator of right and wrong, of what's good. Of, of, of godly values and godly character and integrity. All that's birthed in the home first before you go out. Now, you can learn it later, but most of that is got from mom and dad in the home and through brothers and sisters and through that dynamic. So please be praying for families. Be praying for, you know, our country. Be praying for these elections. Uh, you know, we, we really need prayer, church. We do. Yeah. Thank you. Let's go ahead. We'll close. <laughs> Priscilla, would you like to? Oh, you got something? I was going to say, and I had a very young people would ask me, uh, what advice would you give me? And say, get away from the marriage. I say, you're a key inside of being loving. And keep the line of communication open. Amen. And listen to each other. Don't yeah. just talk at each other. Listen to each other. Yeah, that's good. Very hard. Amen. That's good, mm -hmm. Priscilla. Amen. Speaking of praying, would you like to close us? <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you for joining us tonight.